Hello everyone and welcome to the start of Season 2 of Military Mutterings. Yes, it has been a bit of a while since we were here last. And just to clear up some clarifications uh, from the last video, the major clarification being it was the 81st anniversary of the, Dobak of the Drawback Sound, not the 80th. I appear to be a year in the past. However, oh, no. we are kickstarting this season of Military Muttering with a rather intriguing little uh, missile system, which well, became the uh, became something else that's rather intriguing. So today, on military mutterings, I, Jack Fletcher, and my good friend, me, Gary Johnson, shall discuss the SRAM, the dogfighting missile. So, Kevin, <clears throat> what do we know about SRAM? Now, you see, originally the SRAM was called the Tail Dog, which I find is actually a pretty cool name for a missile if you think about it. Because, you know, the whole point of the SRAM was for it to be cheap, short range, and, well, the short range sort of came as a byproduct, so cheap and very maneuverable mm. and pretty much just always deadly. Well, but you say it came as a byproduct, but it was also developed partially because of the experience required. Before that is a short true, range yeah. um, air-to-air missile from the American experience in Vietnam. That is true. Now that you mention it, so I guess sort of all these three things come together as one. But I think the primary motive here was for it to be cheap and also for it to be able to be mounted on pretty much anything, which we'll get later into later. Now, actually, so the SRAM was Hawker Siddeley's third generation air-to-air -air missile, and it was visually aimed, and it's it was guided by a passive infrared homing system. Now, also something I like a lot about the SRAM is it pretty much can lock on to anything in a very wide field of view. So even when you're sort of, you've got only got one shot at the enemy and the enemy is not really straight in front of you anymore, you can still fire it. And that is mainly because the SRAM was the first rocket in the world with thrust vectoring. First missile there, even. Oh, yeah. <laughs> missile? This is not really a rocket anymore. It would be well, an interesting rocket, rocket if it was. It's a rocket with extra steps. Yes, it's a rocket with a mind of its own. Now, what's interesting to note about the SRAM, it wasn't rail-launched. Mm. It was launched from tubes, which mm -hmm. meant that on one rail, whereas you would only normally have, for example, a singular AIM-9G, for example, you could have two SRAMs. Exactly. Like, the most standard mount was just a dual mount. So you would just have one mount and then a tube on either side of it. The photo we've got in front sort of shows that. Yes. So, Kevin, let's get into a rather interesting little thing we could click on the PowerPoint. Whoa. And yes, for those of you wondering, we are indeed using PowerPoint. <laughs> we have the budget of about 50 yen. So, um, yes, this is the most bare bones, down to earth, military I wouldn't say show but series that you could probably I come mean, across because we will admit here and now we will get some things wrong we're only human I we mean, don't we, know how we, we make to we've already possible. made mistakes look at the previous couple of videos yes but you know say, it's I don't it's just fun doing this yes now apologies for that little tangent but we just thought <laughs> we'd point out we are professionals <clears throat> we aren't historians we're just two people who like military history. Exactly. And now, back to your featured program with Harrier T-52 and Hunter F-6. Now, Kevin, what's so special about these aircraft in particular? Now, these ones that we got right here are the only aircraft that actually carried it. If we look at a certain video game called War Thunder, we have a Harrier GR1, which is the standard sort of Mark 1 that the British uh, use themselves, and it has access to the uh, to the SRAMs, the same sort of SRAMs that we see on the Harrier photo at the top. But the thing is, the GR1 never actually carried these. It could have carried them, but it didn't do it. The one we see in front right here is the Harrier T-52. It's a... Uh, technology demonstrator for the export market and it was based on the T2 2C trainer Harrier version. Now this was and pretty much Hawker 
being like, well, mm. let's put the SRAMs on. We show the export market, yo, you can mount these on. And yes, it is based on a GR1, but it's not a GR1, really. It's it's kind of its own thing at this point. And what's interesting to note is that as a technology testbed, it's not only demonstrating the SRAM itself, it is also demonstrating its VTOL capability, which is which was also at this stage a rather innovative, neat little technology, mm-hmm. which is uh, rather intriguing to say the least. <laughs> Although it's not very visible on the photo, but I wonder if it still has the uh, Aidens on the mounted under the belly. Maybe I not. don't think it does. Yeah, I don't see the not. little because remember the Harrier. <sighs> With the Harrier, I believe it is the case of the Aidens are actually in gun pods below the. It doesn't yeah. come with them internally mounted, I don't think. Well, the ammo is internally, but the guns are external. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Uh, I think so. Yes, yeah, But anyways, like. We don't know. Going back to it, so. As a counter argument, however, like the Astron was, uh, was built to be put on basically anything. The mount was lightweight. If your wing could hold any sort of, like rocket pod you could also mount an SRAM pod to be honest because it literally really is as you see on the photo below of the hunter f6 it's just your regular mount coming off your wing and then just a beam with two tubes that's literally all there is to it mm-hmm. and the missiles themselves are completely self-homing and everything it's got all the system it needs inside of it so your plane doesn't need anything extra hell if they so you... if they put it on a swordfish it would have still worked Yes, so essentially, you've doubled your firepower, although you've limited your range, because the SRAM, as a dogfighting missile, did not have a very long range. Yeah, but I think it really... Sh- I, I'm i surprised it didn't work that well on the export side of things, because I see these as the perfect home defense missiles. You know, when somebody does invade your airspace, he's pretty much already there, you know. You don't need super long-range stuff. You don't need the most sophisticated things. You just fly up there with your... Everybody was using an F-104 at this time or something. You just fly up there, you fire an SRAM, and away you go. Yes. So, if you would like to move on to our final slide. These... Now, remember when we said moments ago <laughs> could be mounted on basically anything. These were the, some of the potential operators. Some and of them, keep like... in mind, we have... Well, Kevin has added the name on here. Yeah. So we, I... are, we, we are mostly right with these. Some of these are obvious. I don't know about the Tornado, but we've got... What other aircraft would it be? You've got... I mean... It wouldn't be one of the Soviet block aircraft, sorry to interrupt, because yeah. that's... You know, we were against the Soviet bloc at that point. I think <laughs> so, after Britain sold their jet engine to Russia, I don't think they were very keen on selling their new a- anti-air missile. <laughs> <laughs> we could have sold it for civilian purposes. Ah, yes. <laughs> so what you've got but, here um, is... Yeah, so this photo... I've, I've seen this photo um, fly around quite a lot, and I see everybody discussing, oh, what's this, what's this? So I thought, you know, let's just look at all the comments. Like, look, Let's look for myself. Let's add the names to it. So people actually know what we're looking yes. at. So, so what you've got here, if I may list. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. The Phantom, the Harrier, Mirage, Jaguar, Tornado, A4, which will be the E variant, and the F5 Freedom Fighter. <clears throat> These One thing are... I will have to note, hmm? uh, maybe it's not specifically the A4, the A4E, sorry. It could it pretty much A4, be anything. Yeah. Like... And the F5, um, I forgot the name, but it was another plane that was um, also ba- based on... I think it came after the F5, and it looks very similar, so it could also be that one. But the F5 is just more common, and also an export plane, so I think that's more more, a more likely option there if they have the F5. Export plane with export missile? Oh. I think of next. <laughs> export pilots. Hmm. <laughs> Well, don't don't give North Korea too many ideas if we remember the Vietnam or the Korean War. <laughs> but if we think about it, so the only one missing here is the Hunter F6 that we know of, at least. And I think there are so many more other options out there. Like, as for the Mirage, you can pretty much say any type of Mirage will work here. For the Phantom, any version of the Phantom. Anything of the Jaguar, maybe even the French one. I think the most interesting one out of all of them is the tornado. 
because that's like the more modern, modern one out of the bunch. Yeah. yeah. There's also a smack in the center of the poster. Maybe that's why. <laughs> advertising. Exactly. Double advertising. Well, as a final note for this, what I will say is that although the SRAM wasn't really accepted into service, it did not die in vain. In fact, in 1980, it became the basis for the ASRAM project, which developed missiles such as the AIM-132, which are still in use to this day. Hmm. Like, um, like to to round it up, what happened to the ASRAM is, uh, as usual with a lot of nations, um, some major budget cuts were added in. So the whole ASVAM program was sort of not being uh, prioritized anymore. And in April of 1977, the UK government announced that they were going to be using the AIM-9L Sidewinders instead. So the ASRAM was um, sort of faded out of history, to be honest. Because I've really not heard that much about the ASRAM. And I, I didn't even know that the ASRAM came after it. Yes. Well, on uh, that note, regarding the ASRAM, it is one of those classic say designs that shows that it is true as the old proverb goes that the missile knows where it is <laughs> apart from when it doesn't I, re I really thought we were going to be able to go through this video without you making that reference but I guess not <sighs> yes you expect too much of me oh, anyway <laughs> I'd rather you didn't anyway so unless Kevin has any further comments no I mean, all I, can, all I can say is season two's here. Our little break is over. We're, we're back to it once a week. Yes, or bi-weekly, depending on our schedule of personal lives. That is However, true. However, what we must say is that season two is lining up to be a rather nice season. In fact, shall we tell them what the next episode is? No, 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 no. Well, no. We'll keep it a secret. Yes. So, we will <laughs> see you all next week for the next episode of Military Muttering which will, of course, be uploaded Friday lunchtime. Depending on where you are in the world. <laughs> it could be Friday, it could be Saturday, it could be Thursday, and it might not even be lunch. How about you subscribe um, and you find out? That is true, you could do that. <laughs> so, until next time, goodbye. See ya.